Well, we are back with the podcast, and we have video today because we've got Bill in the Yay! pilot's chair. Yay! you, Bill. Hopefully, you'll hear him chuckling I in the background. I hope so, too. I am here with Sky Jatani. Hi. Hi, Sky. <laughs> Boy, what's so funny? You just changed it up. Sky's, yeah, you never know. You never know. Sky's mm. looking a little bedraggled. No, he isn't. He just has a 5 he o'clock sh- shadow. I didn't shave today. He's not shaven. I, I woke up at 6 a.m. He's not shaven. And I spent quite a few hours in my office writing, taking a brief break to drive my children to school. Yeah. And then I looked at the clock and went, oh, I got to do a podcast. Okay. So I quickly showered yeah. and dressed. That's fine. And didn't shave. And did not shave. And Christian Taylor. Hey, Phil. Who is, at least according to Bill, <laughs> pretty in periwinkle. Thanks, guys. Pretty in periwinkle. Yeah, I love Isn't this color. She? But I kind of, do I disappear into the set? Yeah, a little bit. A little, a little bit. bit? A little bit. Very Someone nice. said our set was distracting. Yeah, he, I can't he imagine. <laughs> it's kind of like your brain. <laughs> I always wanted to do something with like a Charlie Rose set. What does he do? Black? It's just nothing. Just nothing. nothing. It's just a round table. Yeah. yeah, that's nothing. But there's nothing to distract you from the riveting that's conversation. Like not even trying. You didn't even try. It's minimalist. It is. Oh, there's something good in something. Like my head. <laughs> hey, it's a podcast. What do you know? Hey, it's a podcast. And we're back with video. Hey, it's a podcast. So lend an ear. The Phil Fisher podcast starts right here. We'll talk to Sky. Hi, Phil. He seems kind of bored with routine today. <laughs> I'm ready to blow things up. Christian, too. Hi, Sky. <laughs> Hi. We got no guest, none here for you. Hey, it's a podcast, so lend an ear. The Phil Fisher Podcast starts right here. The Phil Fisher Podcast starts right here. Hey, before we jump in yeah. to the content, can I plug? Promo. I got a promo. Okay, guys, here's the deal. So there's a whole new thing going on. A like whole new thing? whole new thing. The uh, the Democratic debate? No. Oh, okay. What's no, skyjatani.com. Oh. And, and Taco, by the way, is really low on juice, so he's <laughs> he's not here today. Um, so the webs my website's been redesigned. The the devotional, the I daily like devotional. The devotional, like yeah. the delete top. It's little been picture. totally redesigned. I got a great new team working mm-hmm. on stuff. Mm-hmm. But here's the deal. So um, we've brought new coordination to like my editorial work. Which means every month on my blog we do they edit? I hope. Yeah, they do. (laughs) So every month on my blog we're having a theme. So for October right now we're dealing with um, how to love our non-Christian neighbors, and next month it'll be a different theme. So every month I'm writing, uh, every week I'm writing a new blog post on that topic in some form or another. But then we're trying to coordinate that topic with what we're doing in the daily devotional. So if you engage those blog posts or even some of the conversation we have here on the podcast around those topics, and you want to go deeper then you can sign up for the Daily Devotional, which is $1.99 a month, and you can do that at skyjatani.com. Uh, the other thing I wanted, ding, ding. Ding, ding. The ding. other thing I wanted to mention is I've heard from quite a few people online and actually met some people, including yesterday one, who thanked me for the devotional and say, oh, I, I forward that to like all my friends and neighbors and 50 people. <laughs> That's all great, and I appreciate your enthusiasm. Um, it is copyrighted material, and... I'm not going to tell people you can't forward it because I want people to benefit from it, but this is like a a big part of the sustainability of my own ministry and existence. So if you wouldn't mind encouraging people, if you are forwarding it to a lot that enjoy it, to sign up themselves, or there's a group subscription option, which allows you to sign up a family or a small group or something. What's that? Because I've been forwarding it to all my family. Well, you you can sign up like your whole family. (laughs) I have to be honest. (laughs) You, You can sign up your whole family at a discounted rate, and the more people that sign up under your group, the more discounted it is. Oh, good. But the big thing is coming soon, and I don't know if it'll be out by the time this podcast airs, we are initiating a referral program where if you invite your friends and they sign up, you get yeah. you get discounts and points toward things like copies of my books. I How about a, t-shirts? Whoa. I have a new ebook coming out soon that I will be talking whoa. about soon. So there's all that. So please tell your friends, neighbors, colleagues, anyone who you think would be uh, benefited by the devotional to go ahead and sign up and share it if you will, but it'd really help if you would share the <laughs> sign-up page rather than just the devotional itself. <laughs> okay. So thank you guys for supporting it. Okay, and I have a promo. What is that? I have a promo thing. On the 20th of October, which is just a few days of when this comes out, it will be the day after this comes out, I think. I think it will be the day after. I think it's next Tuesday. That's the day of. The day you are today, watching this. While you are watching and listening. The day that is today in the future of now, when you watch this then, is the release of Galaxy Buck. Woo! My new film, 40 Minutes of Exciting Space Adventure with Puppets and a Whole Lot of Styrofoam. 
for your kids to learn about walking with God. It's really good, honestly. And my children have screened it, and they really liked it. Wait a second. Yeah. What? My children haven't Whoa. screened it. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, Scott, you weren't supposed to say anything. <laughs> I feel really but left the out. private screening you were invited to. <laughs> See, I just don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> he would just he, my kids are younger uh -huh. it was, and it was actually only my two younger ones who saw it not yeah, the yeah. Ones, so it, was okay. a, it, was a, it was a last minute thing it was mm -hmm, last whatever. minute and, and <laughs> we were drunk and I don't know what happened <laughs> <clears throat> so the 20th and it'll be in Walmart it will be in Walmart it will be it will be in Walmart they've taken an order and, and every Walmart will have I don't know at least one copy <laughs> <laughs> so and we need them to sell out of Walmart or Walmart will pack them all up and send them back to us and ask for their money back which is unpleasant so go to Walmart on the 20th and buy Galaxy Buck and um, it's my turn now okay okay I have nothing to promote <laughs> not a single thing what about meetchristiantaylor.com? Oh, yeah. Actually, you could go to meetchristiantaylor.com. You're promoting the color periwinkle today. I am. I'm here representing. Here, today's show is brought to you by Sky's Devotional, My Movie, and the color periwinkle. <laughs> it's like Sesame Street. Yeah. yeah. And the, the letter C. I'm fine with that. What are we talking okay. about today? Hey, religious people do some weird things. They do? Yeah. I've heard this. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a little concerned that, you know, globally, religious people are giving ammunition to people who are against religion because they say religion makes the world a worse place and makes people do stupid things. And then there's a lot of examples. And then I don't like it when you see lots of examples. Now, this is this first one isn't really dangerous or anything, but it is, is a, it a little bit silly. Um, in Pakistan, Pakistani pilgrims are flocking once again to the crocodile shrine. Isn't that in Orlando? <laughs> is that where they worship it's crocodiles? Gator. That was funny, Sky. Gator no, really, no, seriously, but the, isn't, isn't there like an alligator? Gatorland. Gatorland, that's, yeah. it. that's Gator, it. Gatorland, yeah. So uh, how is that different than a crocodile shrine? The lean days appear to be over for Moor Sahib, an 87-year-old crocodile. 87-year-old crocodile. And his name is he's Moor? Almost, he's Moor? almost a legitimate dinosaur. Sahib, he is. He, he remembers dinosaurs. Yeah. He remembers, I remember the dinosaurs walking around. Reminds me of Benson. I knew John Kennedy, sir, and you are no John Kennedy. You are no remember? John Kennedy. Yeah. Uh, venerated by Pakistan's tiny Shidi community. As pilgrims, Excuse me? Shidi. <laughs> no, as, not, not that, what That you may be your shy. opinion, my S -H -E -E -D -I. friend. S-H-E-E-D-I. It could be Shetty. Is two E's. S H E E D I. Right, it's got to be. It could she be she Eddie. She D. It could be she Eddie. She D. Community. The aging reptile waddled out of the murky water towards a crowd of visitors wearing garlands, all hoping to lure him with handfuls of sweets and choice pieces of goat neck. And really, who doesn't want to be lured by choice pieces of goat neck? That so, sounds like a, a, a line from the Song of Solomon. That's, that's how my mother got me to go to kindergarten when I didn't want to leave. She'd throw goat neck out on the sidewalk and I'd follow it all the way to So let me get this straight. There's a bunch of people that are trying to visit him that are luring him to them yes. with pieces of food. Yes. Come to me, crocodile. Yes. I have food uh, for you. The autumn celebration, four sheedy communities slaughter goats and dance to a drum beat before the crocodile crocodiles who are showered with rose petals and anointed with perfume and saffron. This sounds no, this much more like crazy. Indian Hinduism than Pakistani yeah, so it's Islam. A, it's a sect of Islam in <clears throat> Pakistan that has had to go under ground because of the Taliban, because they didn't approve of it. Because it's seen as idol worship. I imagine so, yes. The community believes the crocodiles living in the shrine's pond are the disciples of saints. I think, are these the same crocodiles that ate the bad guys at the end of Temple of Doom? <laughs> or Peter Pan. Yeah. Tick, tock. Tick, Crocodiles top. are pretty much universally bad guys. They are. How, I don't, how would you come to the conclusion that they were the disciples of saints? Maybe they ate the saints how? and they, you know, consumed their spirit and essence. It's well, they must have done originally something very, you know, treacherous and awful for people to be afraid of them and think they had all this power they, in order to they, worship them. They ate you. Yeah. Probably. I think that was probably what they did. See, this is much more common in India where, you, you know, you have a whole temple with monkeys 
and another temple with rats and another temple with you why know. do people yeah. worship <clears throat> things that are like things things <laughs> that that don't do I just anything think it's interesting i just think it's interesting that in an age you know cuz most of these people would have smartphones and and probably internet access in many cases and so we're in an age where you know we're we're scientific and we we avoid uh, superstition and it's been dangerous to do this because of the Taliban but the first chance you get it's like we got to get back to the crocodile shrine right we got to do the crocodile well, thing my hunch would be it's be- it's because they genuinely believe that this veneration of these crocodiles brings blessing or protection or some kind of yeah. alleviation of their fears so it's it's okay something you do. next weird thing weird thing number two uh, I don't know if you heard about this. Uh, two weeks ago, a, a Hindu mob beat a man to death in India because the, he, it was rumored that he had eaten beef. Yes, I did hear this. Yeah. I did not hear this. Yeah, because you're not supposed to eat beef if you're Hindu, but he's not Hindu. He's Muslim. No, no, but you're not supposed to. Uh, cows in general are, are, sacred. are sacred. Like if you go to a McDonald's in India, they don't serve beef. What do they serve? Mutton. Mutton ain't nothing but mutton. To so eat. cows in <laughs> India are never supposed to be eaten. Nothing having to do. It's with It's a cow. bad deal. Yeah, you don't want to do holy. that. And really, when you see these cows, there ain't much to eat on them. They're like giant greyhounds. <laughs> so what? Are they as fast? No. Do they race them? <laughs> they no. Chase a rabbit. No. These are these are not like American cattle. You know these. Right. The, and they they're right. you know they're they're useful for their milk. I'm just saying when when a mob of people kill a man. Because he may or may not have eaten hamburger. Well, it doesn't make religion look very good. The story I heard, and I think I heard it on the radio, was that somebody passed by his home and saw some dogs eating some meat in an alley or near the house or something. And, and they assumed, and he was a Muslim, they assumed it must have been beef. And so then they, this angry mob, and you know, it's not just about the cow and the meat and all that. It's it's this taps into centuries of animosity between Hindus and Muslims. Yeah, and when you're part of a Muslim minority in a denom- in a Hindu dominated area, y- you feel threatened. And so they came mm-hmm. up with what they assumed was an excuse to go after this guy. It turned out they later tested the meat; it was not beef. Really? Yeah. Oh. And his mother was also beaten very meat badly. Identity? Yeah. They beat his mother. Yeah. Did they both die? No, the mother survived. But he died? Yeah. <sighs> okay. But so it's, now, just, you know, is it's this a, it's just a, confined. The, the, the thing is, I'm, I, mean, I know this answer before I ask it, but <laughs> it, it, it isn't just confined to <laughs> Hinduism or Muslim religion. Christians would Islam. never do anything like that. Never. Christians, people who say they are Christians, we love each other. would never do anything oh. that would convince people that maybe all of religion needs to be eliminated. True. In upstate New York last week. That never <laughs> happened. But but can I just clarify one thing before we go on? Yes. So do you remember when I said, what has ever gone wrong when you've used love and had compassion? Oh, and you yeah. said... Jesus got crucified. Right. And I said, oh, well, you do have a point there. But I started thinking about that. And It was what, a cheeky response. It was a cheeky yeah. response. It was a cheeky response. And it was funny and sort of true. But what I realized was, as I was thinking about this, yes, for the person who loves or gives compassion, oftentimes it's painful and there's a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. But my question is, when you've had love and compassion toward others, even though it may harm you, doesn't it benefit everyone else? Yeah, but ultimately we're called to live that way not because of the, the practical outcomes. But we live that way because it is a sign and evidence of the reality of God and His kingdom among us, even if it brings right. Right. persecution and death. There, right. Right. there could be a cost. People hiding Jews during World War II were showing love, right. and, and bad things happened. And now I have brought Nazis and Hitler into the conversation, <laughs> which means. I saw that the, post. The good, today. Was it Godwin? Yeah. The Godwin principle? The Godwin principle? Yeah. Godwin's law. Godwin's Can law. Can you explain this? Like, I reading it, I, I got. Sort of the idea, but yeah. it was too murky for me. So I, I, I did some research <laughs> on it. It was there's a Wikipedia entry and other stuff on it. So Godwin's law argues that, especially on the internet, when if if you allow a conversation to go long enough, 
eventually any topic or conversation at some point is going to mention either Hitler or the Nazis. <laughs> and then an amendum to that is if, if you're in an argument or you're debating a topic with somebody and you, whoever references Hitler or the Nazis first automatically loses the argument. Because, because? Because it tends to be a way of dismissing the other person's point of view because you say, oh, that's what Hitler or the Nazis would say, which means I don't have to take you seriously. You don't have to. Right. Uh, or it becomes such an extreme position that if you don't agree with me, you're basically siding with Hitler and the Nazis, that it just completely uh, shuts well, down any it, meaningful it, dialogue it, or yeah. conversation. It happens in our politics that, all the time. But maybe that means you win. Maybe you don't want there to be meaningful. Well, but you, uh -huh. you're not really persuading so, people. So are you point. saying that we probably should just never, never invoke the Hitler or Nazi thing I, it's anymore ever? It's way too, it's lazy is what it is. It's a lazy way to make a point. Okay. You, you need to win your point of view and, and be more persuasive than what just playing the Hitler card. Idi Amin. What about him? Pol Pot. Oh, why don't we use them? Stalin. Yeah. Can we invoke those? Well, yeah, there, I don't know the rule. Most people don't know the details enough of those incidences. Yeah. Okay. Some people may not even know what Pol Pot is, but okay. I mean, it would be very difficult to find somebody that didn't know about Hitler. You Isn't know, your opinion about uh, school prayer reminds me a lot of John Wayne Gacy. <laughs> <laughs> Who's he? Mm, yeah. What did he do? <laughs> Killed a bunch of I know. people. Buried you know what Pol Pot is? In his basement. Well, I know who it's he delicious. is. It's delicious. But, but I, I don't know what you're about to say. <laughs> That's what they do at the Polish Baptist Church. <laughs> potluck. What? Pole potluck. A pole potluck. Oh, I was looking at marijuana and I don't know what. <laughs> Trying to make sense it's out of that. It's a marijuana survey. How, what percentage of Colorado has now smoked marijuana? See, you take a pole pot. <laughs> it's a pot pole. It's a pot pole. <laughs> okay, okay. okay so, so. so Christians, unfortunately, and Christian, I'm using air quotes, you know, because obviously anyone who doesn't do what I think a Christian should do isn't a real Christian, <laughs> which is what I learned from Adolf Hitler. Um, uh, you lose the argument. New, <laughs> New Hartford, New York. And this is not a happy story. Um, two brothers were brutally beaten in a church, one fatally, in an effort by their parents, sister, and other members of the congregation to get them to confess their sins. Of eating beef? They, they never, the police actually said they don't know. They don't know what the sins so were. So their own aunt beat them up? Yeah. And sister. And, and sister. And parents. And parents. Now, is In fact, this their a parents Christ have been charged with manslaughter. Is this a Christian church? It is the Word of Life Church. Word of Life Church. In upstate New York. Uh, police said spiritual counseling, and here the police use air quotes, so I'm copying the I think police. they use real quotes. Oh, yeah, they did. <laughs> you can't really do air quotes in writing, can you? <laughs> well, well, you? You know what I was thinking about today? You're such a you, quick thinker. You mm. so got like me. Gotcha. I got to respond with Hitler. something about Nazis. <laughs> Police said spiritual... Nazis use air quotes. Spiritual counseling at the Word of Life Church in upstate New York turned into an hours-long attack Sunday night in which Lucas Leonard, 19, and his 17-year-old brother Christopher were pummeled with fists and kicked. Um, it was in they, the church is in a an old uh, elementary school where several of the congregation families also live. It's like a commune. So it's a bit uh, yes, and the neighbors say they're a little weird. They keep to themselves. That anyone who says they keep to themselves, that's pretty much a trigger warning that they're going to do something terrible eventually <sighs> if you keep to yourself. The key to not ending up in the news for doing something terrible is to not keep to yourself. What's the opposite? Keep to others? To socialize. To keep to everyone. I'm going to keep to you so that I that don't no end up doing something terrible. So the parents are now charged with manslaughter. So what we're saying is that in just about every religion we could name, people, people have done bad things people go in the name of their God. So what do they all have in common? Uh, th th they are using... I, that's what I'm looking for. They are using I'm, God. Well, because if I were a critic of religion, what I would say is the commonality here is that they, they find authority in irrational or non-scientific sources, and so they do things that defy reason. They it, don't use reason to determine truth. Yeah, but the problem with that argument is you can, you can cite right. examples from history of non-religious groups or non-religious regimes using reason 
and logic to do really terrible things. But with alligators? Like Hitler and the Nazis? That would be one example. <laughs> well, but uh, yeah, but we've already mentioned this on previous podcasts. Uh, communist atheistic regimes like Pol Pot in Cambodia, yeah. like Stalin, yeah. like Mao in but, China. But they had reason behind them. Yes, but they still did terrible things. <laughs> so it's not a matter, I mean, truly, as horrible as what happened in upstate New York is, there was probably an internal logical system to what they did that justified their right. behavior to themselves. Right, and, and they said that the, the boys were required to read the Bible two hours a day before they were beaten to death for not confessing their sins. I'm just not sure. How would you get that out of the Bible? How would you say, oh, sorry, you know, you, because well, you're not confessing, we're going to... Uh, you can isolate some passages of the Old Testament that might justify that kind of thing, but it's, again, it's by isolating and not... Well, they didn't stone them, and, and it was for not confessing. Confessing what? Did they yeah, ever say? I, no, what if they, they didn't they have anything say. to confess? I'm, 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 trying to, I'm trying to think through someplace in the Bible where you could even justify you're supposed to confess your sins because you're not. We have to, you know, the, the, the group has to punish you. Mm. Oh, sorry, I whacked my microphone. Where would you even get that? I don't, that doesn't seem... See, but this like is what happens when really can... sick people use the authority of Scripture to justify their own... And when they go off and live by themselves. Yeah. What's sad is there is always going to be man's inhumanity to man. Right. And <laughs> but it, why? Because Christian? because we're sinful is it people. Because of testosterone. No, nope, it's because of the fall. Because women don't do that. It's because women are only well, kind. Women beat these kids up too. Apparently. Oh, yeah, that's apparently. true. So so man's inhumanity to man comes from our sinful fallen nature, which you both know. Yeah. Personally. And, and so it's just that at times we use reason to justify our bad behavior, and at other times we invoke the divine to justify our bad behavior. There you go. Pretty we simple. will always find excuses for bad behavior. Yeah. But it's really it's sad. Just, it's uh, sad because it makes the outside world invalidate religion. Right, right. But... Uh, there was a great article in uh, the Christian Science Monitor about why religion still matters. Actually, a def- can I ask you a question a about the Christian Science Monitor? Yeah, I mean, what is it? Because I always thought it's that Christian Science now. was bad. It's really just a newspaper now, a big newspaper in Boston that was that came out of uh, Mary Baker Eddy started it, right? I don't really know the history. Why? Why? <laughs> why don't you know the history? I don't, when I think of Christian Science Monitor, I wonder, is it a flat screen? Is it an old <laughs> cathode ray tube? Is it LCD? Has it been born again? <laughs> it's, a, it's a major newspaper, I think, in Boston. It was started by Mary Baker Eddy, who's the founder of Christian Science, which is not Orthodox Christianity. But I don't think it, I don't think it, I think it's just a normal newspaper. Right, like, like we talked last week of Christian institutions, hospitals, colleges, schools in England now that still have Christian names, but really no... Uh, okay, yeah. so anyway, what'd they say? Christian identity. Yeah. So they <clears throat> say, um, while headlines often decry the de-churching of America and experts talk about the country becoming more secular like Europe, people are going to church and embracing religion in numbers that defy popular perceptions. Um, experts note America is far from becoming a churchless nation. On any given Sabbath, for instance, some four out of ten Americans will make their way to churches and synagogues, mosques, and temples, a number that hasn't fluctuated dramatically in the past half century. More than 81% of Americans say they identify with a specific religion or denomination. 78% say religion is a very or fairly important part of their lives. 57% believe that religion is able to solve today's problems. Uh, Organized religion this summer ranked fourth. This is interesting. Organized religion ranked fourth among 15 American institutions in the degree of public confidence it inspired. But, oh yeah, go ahead. Ahead of the presidency, the U.S. Supreme Court, and medicine, but behind behind small business, because of course... We all have our faith There's in small no business. No one I trust more than my local dry cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> Behind small business, the military, and perhaps surprisingly, police. Hmm. That was done before a bunch of other stuff this summer, so, I think, clearly. <laughs> so the first, first person you'll go to with your problems in society will be your local dry cleaner. Then... Then you'll go to the army. <laughs> okay, my dry cleaner couldn't solve this. <laughs> Can you send a tank? Then you'll go to the police. Then you'll go to religion. What they're not telling you, and this is based on other studies, is that uh, 
back, I think, in the late 60s, early 70s, the church was the highest ranked, most trusted institution in the country, and it was, I think, in the 60 or 70 percent range of people thought the church was highly reliable or trustworthy or whatever. And within a few years, I think by 2012 was the last research I saw, confidence in the church was down to 44 percent of the population. So it's taken, it's still taken a, a hit. It's still taken a hit. Now, interestingly, every institution yeah, everything has taken a hit. Because of the 60s. Well, we a lot of things, but we're... I, I think it's because Hitler and the Nazis. Yeah. <laughs> there is, <laughs> a, there is a, a growing anti-institutional bias in our whole culture. So yeah. the fact is, yeah, the church still ranks higher than a lot of institutions, but it's much less than it used to be. So there's multiple ways to look at this. Interesting. So um, Gallup reported recently that while attendance may be off in churches, Americans are no less likely now to attend religious service than they were in the 1940s and 1950s. In other words, there was a spike in mm -hmm. the 1960s and 19, uh, late 1950s and 1960s. Uh, and uber-religious, this is the article talking, uber-religious years of the mid-1950s and early 1960s when Americans in lockstep got married, had children, and went to church. The lesson, says the editor-in-chief at Gallup, um, whose company has tracked church attendance for 70 years. That's, wow. long, that's almost as old as the, the holy crocodile <laughs> oh, that yeah. they're anointing with saffron. Saffron crocodile, that's... Delicious. Smells yeah. good. Yeah. Um, religious worship in the U.S. is cyclical. That's the conclusion of the editor-in-chief at Gallup. It's not steadily in decline, but it actually goes up and down, and it's right now coming down from an up phase of the 50s and 60s. That's interesting. It is interesting. I'm not sure it's cyclical. But Gallup said so. The editor-in-chief of Gallup says I, I would so. agree with them that it's not linear. It isn't always going up or always going down, but cyclical is a whole other thing. It oscillates, but that doesn't mean it's going to... Oscillate. That's like cyclical. But No, it's no, not. No, it's not. Because cyclical cycl is going in a circle. It means we would return to the attendance rates we might have seen in the 50s and 60s when I'm not sure that's the case. Well, no. He's just saying it goes up and down. That's oscillating. That's not cyclical. So you're saying... Or rising and falling would be another way. Yes, it would. You're saying the editor-in-chief of Gallup does not have a good command of the English language. Oh, goodness gracious. I'm saying he could have a better command. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so so why why should we care about this? Uh, more than anything, well, this because there's a narrative. There are always competing narratives. You okay. know, everyone has a competing narrative. You watch the Republican debates. There's narrative. Oh, you watch the Democratic debates. Very different narratives. Whoa, they don't agree with each other at all. And the narratives here are, you know, on one hand, we are becoming secular. We're becoming just like Europe. And and you know, on the far left, people say that, and then they cheer. Yay! We're going to be like Sweden. And on the far right, they say, we are going to hell in a handbag because that's where Europe is. Europe is in hell in a handbag. <laughs> and that's where we're going now, too. And so, so people use that narrative of, oh, we're, we're going away from church, you know, completely um, on whatever side they're on to try to raise money, either celebrate or raise money for campaigning. And what Gallup is saying, that's really not an accurate narrative. Uh, he says, more than anything, some experts argue that the U.S. isn't becoming more secular as much as it's becoming more devout, a country with fewer followers, but ones who are more serious about their faith. Uh, Christian Smith is the director of the Center for the Study of Religion and Society at the University of Notre Dame, and he or she says... I bet it's a he. It's, it's a he. <laughs> You know Christian Smith? I know of him. Oh, okay. Yes. There's a greater willingness now to say, I'm not religious. As a result, he adds, for people who do continue to practice religion, um, their communities tend to be made up of the seriously committed, not just those swept along by obligation. I think he's right. And there's, there's a lot of evidence that points to this, that what we're finding, what's happening is all those nominal Christians who for years and years and years would identify as Christians because they were raised in it or they celebrate Christmas or whatever, there's less social pressure for them to identify as Christians and they're much more likely to identify right. as, oh, I'm not religious. Or, and that's the huge expansion of the nuns. Exactly. Isn't necessarily people changing their minds as much as, as being uh, nominal and just deciding I'm not even going to 
We're right. not even going to check that box anymore. And what I think freaks out a lot of people, including some of the crazy uncles we talk about on this podcast, is the perception that America is becoming a less Christian country because there's less nominal Christianity. Whereas other voices who I think are more reasonable, like Russell Moore, are going, thank goodness. Right. Let's get rid right. of the nominal Christianity because it just dilutes the true gospel. So some people celebrate what's happening, others lament it. Right. And Russell Moore, who's Russell Moore's guy? Russell Moore is the president of the uh, e- e- Evangelical <laughs> no. Liberty no, Council it's, it's... thingamajig. What's it called? <laughs> He was on the cover of CT. It's the Ethics, Ethics and, and Religious, Religious Liberty, Liberty Commission of, of the Southern, Southern Baptist, Baptist Convention. Convention. Hey, Jinx. I'm <laughs> in hearing this in stereo. He, he is the lead Southern Baptist on policy and politics. Right, and he's a good guy. I and like, he's a good guy. I like Russell. Um, and his, his contention, he's actually gotten a lot of press in the last few months because right. he's come out and saying... He's come out saying, yes, America is becoming less Christian. Oh, <gasps> terror, terror. And then he says, and I think it's a good thing. Right. And the reason he thinks it's a good thing is, is he believes Christianity was always supposed to be weird. You know, it was always mm-hmm. supposed to be countercultural, and yet it became so culturalized in America that you could be Christian without even having any idea what that even means. Right, and you just used air quotes for those listening. I used air quotes. So, so let me ask you this. Yes. There are Christians, I believe. Did that, you use air quotes? I didn't. Okay. That no air quotes. That are nominal. Yes. And then there are Christians that are very committed and take it very seriously, and it's very important to them, and they live it out. Yes. As we would expect. And then there are other Christians that take it very seriously, and are just as committed, and and don't live it out as we would expect. That might and so what is what is that? <laughs> You're making a third category. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's the, confusing. The, like the, I'm actually the not, committed but unsuccessful. Well the committed or like the committed but crazy. <laughs> <laughs> the committed so, but to, 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 uh, like a Franklin Graham is what I'm thinking about. Oh, wow. oh, oh I thought you were talking oh. about the upstate New York beatings. The, uh, oh. Or that. Well that's no. those aren't quite no, the same thing. Do you thing. know what I'm saying? I thought though? you were just talking I, about Christians that are committed but they struggle with sin. Well there's that too. That's a fourth category, I guess. <laughs> No. Take one, Sky. Wow. Uh, I guess I'm going to be in trouble now, huh? No. I think it's... uh, mm. What do we call that when when we can sit there and say, okay, that wasn't a very Christian thing to say? That I mean, that you can have... You can be devout. Devout. You can be devoutly committed to anything. And devoutly mistaken. Yes. About what you're committed to. And you can have some... Um, orthodox beliefs and some unorthodox beliefs. You know, you can be a devout uh, vegan, but you can also be a devout vegan who does something that other vegans think is not veganism. Right, 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 right. So that's... A, well, then that muddies the water. It's a different conversation. I think what Russell Moore is encouraged by is um, being a Christian in North America going forward is going to cost more. There has to be an intentionality. And because of that cost, there is has to be more intentionality um, and more motivation to say, you know, why do I think this is worth it for me to stand out in this way that's no longer considered cool? Right. You know, if I'm not going to be one of the cool kids, is this really worth it? And, and have I got it right? Now, whether you've got it right or not is a whole separate thing, and that's why people need to make DVD series for small children that walk them through the Bible. So, <laughs> or read a daily devotional every morning in their email. <laughs> or wear periwinkle right. to oh, go work out. Oh, goodness gracious. Yeah. We um, have come full circle, so I think it's time to end the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> they are interesting times, though, aren't they, that we live in? Interesting they certainly times. are. How d- it's tricky... You know, especially for older people that that if you grew up, I mean, I grew up in small town Iowa. Everybody went to church in small town Iowa, you know. Muscatine. Yeah, everyone was basically white. Everyone was basically Protestant. You know, I don't know if there was even a Catholic church in Muscatine, Iowa. Um, So we had a very common background, very common assumptions, you know, and and that has changed so much that I... Even in Muscatine, Iowa? Probably, I think there's a much larger, you know, Latino population now in in Muscatine, Iowa, which means there's probably a stronger Catholic presence. Muscatinos. Um, 
Maske. <lacht> Guys. That's somebody's T-shirt, but it's not ours. <laughs> um, you know, and so I, I can just, I'm imagining the generation before me and how difficult it would be to say, you know, tell me, how do I, how do I say this isn't wrong? How do I say this isn't bad? You know, and, and to a certain, and that's Franklin Graham's generation. To yeah. say, this isn't the way it was supposed to be. We're so, losing something. Last night I had an interesting conversation with my 13-year-old daughter. And she's in eighth grade at a public school. And is she upset about the secularization of America? No, in fact, it was just the opposite. Oh. So she was telling me about how grateful she is to go to a public school where most of the people don't agree with her faith. Okay. That's because she's crazy. That's because well, she's your daughter. She's your that may daughter. be part of it. I didn't, I didn't prompt for this. I, I did not coach her, but she, she was explaining how it, it forces her to really think about what she believes and why she believes it and, yeah. and figure out what she thinks. And she, this is just for her, I don't think it applies to everybody, but she said, I don't think I would be as strong a Christian if I were in a Christian school. Yeah. I said, well, why not? And she said, because there would be no, every, we, I would just conform to what everybody expects of me and I wouldn't think about it. Mm-hmm. And I had to remind her that there may be a season in your life when that's exactly what you need is, you know, a, a fully Christian environment for a season for whatever reason. So it's not about one or the other, but that right. kind of is a microcosm of what we're facing as a whole culture. When the whole culture is dominated by a nominal Christianity, it's easy to just go along with the flow and go, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian, whatever. But once that flow is gone and you can't go along with it, you have to be very intentional and, and thoughtful about the fact that you're a Christian. And that's what Russell Moore is celebrating. But won't you also, how do you, how do you get people to be more intentional and committed, you know, to a real faith and, and not also have more people also developing little cults in upstate New York as a reaction against secularism. Well, that's, that's the risk of living in a religiously free society. You're, oh, you're going to get... Yeah. Well, and I heard you were supposed to watch some DVD series or read a devotional, <laughs> and that might help. That'll keep you on the straight and narrow. <laughs> can we, can we uh, airdrop, can we fly over all the little communes and cults and and drop our resources into them. Do you think they'd be open to that? Probably not. I could just spam them, I guess. <laughs> you would have to airdrop. I would have to airdrop. Well, you have an actual physical DVD. That, yeah, oh, I could put it online, that's true. I guess. But then then there'd be no transaction and then I go broke. <laughs> they need to pay for it somehow. <laughs> Can I get them to subscribe to Jelly Telly? <laughs> can we get all the weirdos to subscribe to Jelly Telly so we can straighten them out? Well, you'd have to deal with an awful lot of hate mail. Okay. Um, Sky wrote an article, which was interesting, on his blog post. Wait wait a second. We're starting this at an hour in? (laughs) No, we're not an hour (laughs) in. We're close. We're 37 minutes in. Ooh. It just feels like an hour, doesn't it, Christian? (laughs) It really does. It's exhausting. Do you want to save this for next time? Well, it's going to... Do you want to wrap it up because you have to go work out? We won't take long, I don't think. All right. Let's do it. Okay. Sky Sky wrote a blog post called, Work is the New Sex. This is a while ago, by the way. Boy, this is salacious. Yeah, a sky at his most salacious. Hey, titles, that's how you get clicks. Now, the funny, <laughs> the funny thing is, I, at first I thought, oh, he's just trying to get clicks with his title. It's and, clickbait. And then as I, I read it, he actually is making a point. I am. I have those from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> um, according to the International Labor Organization, Americans work more, take less vacation, and retire later than people in any other industrialized country. By any measure, work, uh, by any measure, work is an enormous, even overbring part of our lives. Yeah, uh, two-thirds of church adults surveyed by Barna said they have not heard any teachings about work at their church. So you are comparing um, our reluctance to talk about sex to our reluctance to talk about Work well, at least historically. Historically, I thought you were saying that our obsession with sex has now become our obsession with work. Well, there's a parallel. There's that too. There's a parallel. Okay. So we are, by any measure, a very sex saturated culture. Except now, Playboy has decided to clothe its models, so <laughs> maybe it'll get better. Because mm. there's no point. Because they've given up. Well, because and they want to keep working. Yes, it's, they, they're it's trying ubiquitous, to right. and people are more likely to buy the magazine for the articles actually now than they are for nudity. <laughs> That's silly. So right, the, anyway, go ahead. The basic argument I'm making, and both of these issues of sex and work uh, face an unhealthy dualism in the church. So for a long, long time, sex has saturated our culture, but the church was reluctant to talk about it because eh, it's not appropriate. We just want to ignore it. We're not going to deal with it. But 
in recent years, the church has realized if we stay silent on this topic, then the messaging of the culture wins. So we need to talk about sex from a biblical, theological, Christian point of view. We need to paint a redeemed vision of it. We need, And so you got a lot more churches who are willing to talk about it, either from the pulpit or in support right, groups or right. whatever. Well, it's, it's, becoming, it's become very hard to ignore. Exactly. It's been very well, hard to ignore. Well, it's problematic because marriages are failing right. and there's lots the of other... proliferation of pornography and all right. the other problems that we face. So the argument I'm making in the, in the article is like the proliferation of sexuality in our culture... Our culture is a, is a work-saturated culture, and yet the church is reluctant to talk about it because they don't see it as an important and relevant part of our life. And if the church is silent on it, then the only thing people hear about work is coming from the culture, which makes work into an idol. It makes it unredeemed. And so what I'm calling for is the same approach we took towards sex in the church we need to take toward work and present a redeemed biblical Would vision of stop work. stop doing it? Is that the approach here? No, no, no. <laughs> it's redeem it. Make, oh, make okay. sure we redeem bring it, it under the lordship of Christ and, okay. and present a Christian and so vision for it. what exactly does that look like? Work? Mm-hmm. Why? Under a redeemed vision. Well, it, it starts with biblical theology and recognizing that work is a good thing that God has given to people, and it's part of our image bearing in, his, in the world of, of God and predates the fall. And what is the ultimate purpose of work, and what is a theology of vocation? A lot of these ideas I talked about in Futureville... Yes. Um, here's, a, here's a quote. This is a quote from Sky Jatani. Uh, I can go away now. <laughs> Just as a redeemed vision of sex requires affirming the importance of both desire and self-control, a redeemed vision of work requires both an affirmation of our labor and the importance of resting from it. Right. Sabbath. Sabbath. Among other things. So you think that's w- important? When I was growing mm-hmm. up, we couldn't go out to eat on Sundays. My mom couldn't go swimming. Really? <laughs> Swimming, I don't understand. It but work. But if we went out to eat, then we were... Bl- oh, encouraging others to work. Yes. Oh, mm. interesting. Boy, we went out every Sunday. You did? Yeah. Oh, my, that was so forbidden. My grandpa took us all out. He wouldn't go to movies. Couldn't go to movies ever. But There's only a projectionist working at the movies and all kinds of people working at no, the kitchen. No, no, you couldn't go to movies on any oh, day. Oh, on any day. Any day I of see. the week. Right. Ever. Because they were evil. <laughs> mm. um, redeeming work requires an orderly rhythm of work and rest. But if we rest, we're giving up time where we could be working more. Right. Well, that's the other side of it. Is it's similar to sex. Some people in the culture want to tell us that our whole identity is our sexuality, that that's the most defining thing about us. And we do the right. same thing with work. We, including in the church, tend to believe that our value comes from our effectiveness, from our usefulness, from our productivity, whether that's towards the work of the church or work in general. And by resting, we are affirming the fact that our value is not only linked to our productivity or usefulness, but we have inherent value even when we do nothing. I think that's actually where the discipline of Sabbath originates in the Old Testament. And I think it's Deuteronomy 15, where God is reiterating the Ten Commandments and he's talking about the Sabbath, and he explicitly says you shall remember that you were slaves in Egypt and I rescued you with my outstretched hand. Therefore, you shall rest one day out of seven. And the idea is a slave doesn't get a day off of work, but you are to cease from your labor once a week to remember you're not a slave anymore and I've rescued you and your value to me is not just the way you were valuable to the Pharaoh who you worked for. So resting is a reminder of God's valuing okay. us other than for our You know labor. what? What? I have to work on this. <laughs> She's going to work more no. to try to work less. <laughs> yes, I think that's true. It does take intentionality. Well, it, I mean, because I I don't think I allow myself that ability to rest. I think it's a tricky thing as a mom, mm-hmm. yeah. too, because yeah. my job is taking care of this family. That means feeding them and, yeah. you know, driving them places. And so does here's a question. Does it have to be like one whole day? day where we're resting or like in a day can you carve out a half a day of rest what have many sabbaths yeah what all all i'm advocating for in the article is a regular rhythm of work and rest so i realize with different callings and vocations and stages of life and responsibilities that's going to look different for different people it's just i I don't prescribe any particular model but i think that that rhythm needs to be there in Hmm. some form you also say as with our sexuality we've rejected the idea that our work is a calling we receive from outside ourselves we've lost a theology of vocation yeah what does that mean 
Oh, we, we, we have fallen into the cultural trap that says work exists for my self-fulfillment, just as yeah. my sexuality exists for my self-gratification. Right. Right? And that, that's not a biblical vision of work or sexuality. What? It's about me. Right. What is the biblical vision of work? Uh, our work exists for a couple of reasons. One, like I said earlier, is through our work we manifest the image of God in the world. But we also work, as Paul says in, in Ephesians 4.28, each person should work so that he may have something to share with those in need. So we work as a way of bringing flourishing and blessing to others. Um, that it, it isn't first and foremost about my satisfaction, it's about fulfilling God's call in my life for the sake of the world. And how do we know what that is? Well, that's why you need rest. Because it's in our rest that Wait, we can what? commune deeply with God and discern His calling for us. So does that mean that rest that is me lying on the couch watching the voice might not accomplish what you're saying rest needs to accomplish? Well, I'm not saying that's wrong. I mean, there is a rejuvenation that comes from, you know, enjoying yeah. things like that. But it's not the, it's not the only kind of rest. Because you quote Henry Nouwen. I do who says that we like to stay busy because we want to avoid the noise within us. Your inner life is like a banana tree with monkeys jumping up and down. That's mm -hmm. my inner life for sure. <laughs> <laughs> no question. It also sounds a little bit like a Hindu temple. <laughs> yeah, I have crocodiles jumping up mm -hmm. and down, laced in saffron. And <laughs> reaching for that wonderful succulent goat neck. So it's not simply about ceasing to work. Right. Because I can not work and still keep my <laughs> monkey tree jumping. Yes. Right. And it's very uncomfortable to deal with all the junk in your... Yeah. It's, it's about self-awareness of what's going on inside of me. And this is where communion with God really... I think people experience a lot of difficulty with it. Because in order to have a rich communion with God, you have to have a rich communion with yourself. You have to know what's going on inside of you. And most of yeah. us want to avoid that. So if you're full of fears and anxieties and struggles and concerns and, and all those monkeys jumping around... Keeping yourself externally busy is a way of avoiding that. But when you're not externally busy, you actually have to deal with it. What do you do? Well, that's what you bring before God. And it's also in those times of, of deeper, richer communion that you start to think, well, am I doing what I'm called to be doing? Am I focusing right. on what God's really calling me to do? And that's something you discern individually, but you also need to discern in communion with others. So it's, so it's more than just stopping work. Mm -hmm. It's also developing an inner life that isn't so noisy and, and allows time for introspection and... Uh, redirection. And redirection. Right. And interaction with God. Yeah, and that ultimately, when you resume work, makes that work more valuable and more meaningful right. because now you're doing it with a sense of intentionality and purpose and focus and, and why I'm doing this and how I'm doing this and bringing God into it. But if you never cease... So the analogy I give is music. There was a composer who said that um, music is the silence between the notes that it's the, the rhythm of sound mm -hmm. and silence that actually gives music its power. power. And right. when I play the guitar, those are also the notes I play the best. The silent ones. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. At least I on agree. your ukulele. The other ones can be a little spotty. <laughs> so same thing with our lives. It's supposed to be music, and that means there's time for noise and work and activity, and there's time for silence and reflection, and that creates a rhythm that brings meaning. And so you end up saying that you had to reflect honestly about your time in ministry and whether you had encouraged people towards a harmonious rhythm of work and rest or just added to the cacophony of noise mm -hmm. and the idolatry of achievement. Yeah, I, I did a sermon years ago at Blanchard, our church, after I left staff apologizing to everyone for my unintentional way I was guilting people through my preaching to do more and more and more, particularly through the church ministries. Be busier and busier. Right, because I, I think I had succumbed to an American value that said people's value was linked to their achievement and you need to do more and more for the church rather than displaying for them and um, modeling for them that rhythm of work and rest. But how, do you, how do you balance, you know, I'm not valuing myself from my achievement, but I'm looking at all the needs of the world and I'm overwhelmed with how needy the world is and how can I not p put in 110%? Well, you could probably speak on that better than I can, Phil. <laughs> You've been there. Hey, this is your article. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one quick question before yeah. we wrap up. Do you have any books to recommend that um, sort of give you some tips or uh, suggestions or ideas about how to nurture that inner life or practice that presence of Christ or uh, learn how to be with 
God. Yeah, there's a couple. Yeah, well, there's with. <laughs> there, the, uh, there's one. One of my favorites is an old book written by a guy uh, named Thomas Kelly called A Testament of Devotion. It's a small book. I think it was written in the 1930s or 40s. And that's a good one. It talks about that communion with God. And then, you know, there's always the With God Daily devotional <laughs> oh. to start your day with that. Where, where do you that's get true. that? Oh, skyjutani.com. Wow, that's fantastic. All right. We have to wrap up because one leave. of us is wearing their workout clothes. Yeah, and they're going, going to the straight gym. to the gym now where everyone will be dazzled with the, <laughs> the flurry of periwinkle. Yes. On the, uh, will you be on the treadmill? Where uh, will no, the, I'm working no? with a trainer. I'm going to do... Um, bench pressing Ooh. today. I'm, I'm up to periwinkle and perspiration. I'm up to 65. <laughs> periwinkle pounds. and powerlifting. <laughs> yeah, That's even better. All right, let me try to sum this up. Mm. Hey, buddy, would it make you smile to throw saffron on a holy crocodile, or would you feel like a jerk for doing way, way too much work? Because Sky says you'd be blessed by forming a rhythm of work and rest. And that's the best for you. It's really, really what you should do. And his daily devotional will help you to calm down the monkeys jumping on your banana tree. See you next time. Wow. Bye, everybody. See you guys.